Let me look at this doctrine we're calling AD 70 doctrine because it has been effective in the churches. It has taken over a lot of places uh, and people who were knowledgeable in the faith and knowledgeable of the truth, people that I myself had known and had even had be Bible class teachers for me, et cetera, et cetera. It's an actual threat. It's a real danger. So it's worth looking at that. But my intent today is to uncover the chief method behind this doctrine, how it becomes a problem for people, how it catches us, what is the heart of it, really. And the heart of the doctrine actually is an appeal to reason, the desire to be thought wise. They want to be thought credible amongst uh, secularists, amongst uh, the scientific community, amongst people who are educated, uh, who espouse uh, rational thought of the West in recent centuries. And um, perhaps their thinking is that the straight teaching of Scripture doesn't fit that bill. What I found in the study of this is that for the AD 70 advocates, the Bible becomes credible when you can point to specific things that it talks about that can be verified. Now, this is not terribly different from churches that give evidence-based lessons. I grant you that, and I'm not here to defend those. I actually think those are a bad idea, and for the same reasons. But the Bible's not credible because we can verify what it says, and that's the issue here. We'll examine what they call the center of their teaching, which is the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 about 70 weeks. That's how we're going to take a look at the major the, the chief method of this false teaching. And here we'll get into some details, uh, ask you to bear with me, um, because they take a good bit of patience, I would say. The author of this doctrine is Max King. He wrote a book in 1971 called The Spirit of Prophecy. It, it is that book from which I am drawing the quotations in this lesson and from which I've learned whatever I have learned about this doctrine, not from any practitioners, and not either from brethren uh, giving lessons about this, exposing it as error. I, I'm not, I don't want to be defined by my enemies, and I don't want somebody else to be defined that way to me. I'd like to read and see what he has to say and understand what, where he's coming from, or try to, if possible. But this is the bottom line, is credibility. So, the thing that Max King said, he has a whole chapter devoted to Daniel's 70 weeks. This is, you know, a critical piece of information for, from their perspective. It really is where this all starts in terms of the uh, specifics of the teaching, even though really where it starts is a desire to be thought wise and acceptable among skeptics. But... Um, in terms of the teaching itself and the details, it starts with Daniel 70 weeks. And he first posits this, quote, prophecy, if it is to have credibility, cannot be divorced from the time frame indicated by that prophecy. Now, on the one hand, we would say, well, uh, that almost sounds okay because, you know, he's saying, um, you know, you can't say you're a prophet and say this thing's going to happen and then it doesn't happen. Well, that obviously means you're not a prophet. Okay, fair enough. But that's a little too simple to be making a major premise out of it in the center point of your doctrine, I think. That's not what he's doing. He's saying that credibility, you see, prophecy, if it is to have credibility, credibility hangs in the balance. Does it have it or doesn't it? Well, it does if it is true to the time frame that it indicates. 
So this credibility hanging in the balance is the first thing that I would point you to as a real problem. God's word cannot be believed unless we can rationalize it, unless we can explain it, unless we can verify it, then it cannot be believed. That's not true. God speaks truth. He speaks truth, and that's what it is, and that's what you need. If you're willing to hear and obey, you have what you need. On the other hand, he said that the credibility is only given to a prophecy if it comes together with a time frame. And this also is not actually true. Um, that's the wrong definition of the word prophecy. Prophecy is not pre <laughs> It's not about telling the future, foretelling you know, ahead of time, something that's going to take place with such utter precision that it can't be disproven, although that's what he thinks it is. Prophecy, pro in prophecy, is on behalf of. A prophet is somebody who speaks on behalf of God. And God may be speaking to the people through his word, through the prophet that is written down, about something that is yet future, but he may just as well be speaking about something that has already taken place or something that's happening among them at the time that it was written. The prophet is just speaking on behalf of God, whatever it is that God is saying, without reference to the time frame. Time is not a, a critical element of prophecy and is not genu generally the major premise or the most important thing about it. It is for this doctrine. But in terms of Scripture, generally, no, that's not how this works. And the prophecy of Daniel is, is Daniel chapter 9. It's verses 25 to 27. And uh, I suppose we should read it since it is the subject here. But I really am not going to get into a whole lot of detail about these things. Not Daniel 9, it's towards the end of that chapter, verse 25, 6, and 7. He said, From the going out of the word to restore the, and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there will be seven weeks. Then for 42, I'm sorry, for 62 weeks, it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end will come with a flood, and to the end there will be war. Desolations are decreed, and he'll make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of that week he'll put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the, desolation, on the desolator. All right. That's Daniel 9, 25 to 27. As you can see, that passage is highly symbolic, highly metaphorical, not especially literal, detailed, precise, specific about names, places, events, just on cursory reading of this thing. Not to attack Daniel, but just to say these are the verses about which Max King says Daniel's prophecy of 70 weeks, I'm quoting, is important to us not only because it is the heart of Bible prophecy, but especially because it is a prophecy with a strong time element. And uh, I have pulled the quotation up here, and that is Mr. Yuck in the background if you think you see something. That's the poison control sticker. Okay. I try to put that up whenever I quote error. Although I found it was missing on some of my templates, so please don't hold me to that. I'll try to fix that before the next time. Um, the two things that he says here that I will call attention to are, number one, that Daniel's prophecy of 70 weeks, that's Daniel 9, verses 25, 6, and 7, is the heart of Bible prophecy. Really? We'll talk about that. 
And number two, it is important, especially because it has a strong time element, i.e., there is a precise time here that lends, remember, credibility to the prophecy. This is where he's going. Yes, this is where he's going. I'll tell you right now, and I'll tell you again, and then I'll tell you what I told you, I guess, is what they said I should do. But um, this is where he's going. He's going to say that he can calculate the amount of time between Daniel's prophecy and the appearance of Christ on earth, and that it is this calculation that lends credibility to the entire Bible by lending credibility to this prophecy. That's what they're going to do. That's the heart of the doctrine in the nuts and bolts of it. First thing that I would say about Daniel 9, 25 to 27, was already said, right? That you read it yourself. It's not especially precise or detailed. It's clearly symbolic and metaphorical. That's obvious, if obvious exists, and it may not. But the question, is Daniel's 70 weeks the heart of Bible prophecy? Would you really say this is at the center of everything prophetic in the Bible? We must understand this prophecy in order to understand all Bible prophecy. Would you say that? I wouldn't. You may not even remember having read that passage before, and yet as a Christian, you've probably read it a dozen times. Do you know why that is? Because it's not the heart of the gospel. It's not the heart of Bible prophecy. The reason why is because it's almost never quoted. One time, when Jesus is talking to them about the destruction of Jerusalem, when that occurs in Matthew 24, when that occurs in Mark 13, when that occurs in Luke 21, all the, the parallel passages where Jesus is answering their question about when Jerusalem will be destroyed. It does quote from Daniel 9, 25 to 27, at that point. That's the only quotation. It's the only allusion. That's it. For the heart of Bible prophecy, where are the references to it throughout the Gospels? Some of which, as John said, were written so that you may believe. Why is it the heart of Bible prophecy, the heart of the prophetic references in the Gospels? That makes no sense. Why are there so few references to Daniel, period, especially Daniel 9, which is only one time, when compared to other prophets who are quoted length at length and frequently? When you look at the other prophets and the way that they are being quoted, you know, about not one of his bones will be broken, that's a reference to the Passover. Why are the references to these other prophets symbolic and figurative, but the reference to Daniel, no, that one's literal. <laughs> That's convenient, if inconsistent. And why are there so many oblique references in this guy's argument, trying to define these weeks and trying to define these time frames and trying to find something about this why are the references so indirect if it is the heart of bible prophecy if it is the major premise so that's what he means remember when he said it can't be divorced from the time frame we're building its credibility and we've picked this example because it has a strong time element. This is where he's going with it. Is it the heart of Bible prophecy? No, it's obviously not. If it were, it would appear on more than one occasion. It would be spelled out. It would have something to do with some other reference besides the destruction of Jerusalem. 
That's not true. That's not how it's being used. It doesn't occur in the Revelation. It's never mentioned at any point. How can that be the heart of Bible prophecy? But the second one, the time element, is the one that we're going to have to spend more time on. Strong time element of Daniel 70 weeks. I'm going to go here a little bit more detail into the way that Max King breaks this down. And the way that he's doing this, like I say, at first is believable enough to get in the door. He's got a foot in the door because so far so good. Okay, this kind of makes some sense at first. The first thing that he's going to do is go to Matthew chapter 24 and look at what the Lord said there when they asked him, when is Jerusalem going to be destroyed? And it does quote Daniel 9. It is the place that quotes Daniel 9. He fails to mention it's the only place, but it's the place that quotes Daniel 9. And it is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Well, that, that part is true, and that's interesting. You know, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. I always wondered where that came from. It's Daniel 9. Uh, those verses that we just read, 25, 6, and 7. Yeah, sure enough, that's true. So far, so good. And then he says that Matthew's use of heavens and earth in Matthew 24, when he says the heavens and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Well, that one is, is a prophetic reference. That's not really talking about the heavens and the earth. That's talking about a symbol from the prophets that symbolizes the government of Israel. So that too is referring not to the end of the world, but to the same event, the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of Rome, the end of the Israelite state. Which is why... Because Rome did that in AD 70, we know in retrospect, that's why people call it the AD 70 doctrine, because this is the first thing that has to give way to the original argument that prophecy is credible because you can prove its time frame. And that prophecy is Daniel 9's 70 weeks. In order to make Daniel 9's 70 weeks end in the lifetime of Jesus Christ on earth, he has to shorten the time frame of what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24. It can't be the end of the world, which is yet future, 2,000 years past. It has to have been something that happened at that time in order to stay within the confines of the time frame of Daniel 9. But notice what's driving it's not another verse from Matthew 24 that tells you that's what he was talking about. It's not the questions that they asked him. If you look at the opening of Matthew 24, they asked him both, when will, the, the, when will Jerusalem be destroyed or the, the temple be destroyed? And what will be the sign of the end of the world and your coming? They had two questions and he had two answers. But that's not what King did. He didn't come to you with more verses from Matthew 24 that told him that that had to be metaphorical, not literal. That didn't come from Matthew 24. It didn't come from the rest of the Gospels. It didn't come from the New Testament anywhere. It came from his interpretation of the prophecy of Daniel 9. He made the rule that that has to be literal, 40, that the, the 70 weeks prophecy has to have a literal fulfillment, a literal interpretation and that that time frame requires everything described in Matthew 24 to happen in the first century. So it starts out with him talking about things that are kind of interesting, and then when he says heavens and earth are prophetic, not literal, and he gives you prophecy passages that talk about heavens and earth, and there seems like some validity to the idea that, yeah, that is kind of a common symbol. So it gets you thinking, oh, uh, oh I might listen to see where you're going with this. You know, I might, maybe I'll withhold judgment here for just a second and see what are you going to do. But that's what he's banking on. He wants you to keep listening. He's got his foot in the door.
What I immediately remarked upon before reading the rest of this was that he sure had a strange fascination, a strange fascination with precision. Um, when I was in IT and I worked with a project manager, and she, she gave me a sheet that had a, uh, a projected duration of time that ended in a number of hours. Uh, it was like something like 47.853. And I said... Did this get generated by the spreadsheet? What happened there? She said, oh, no. No, that's just how I make it look really specific so they don't ask me about it. I said, oh, so it's fudged. It's, a, it's an estimate. She said, yeah, it's an estimate. It's within, you know, plus or minus 10 of whatever the number was. I was like, oh, okay. She said, but when I put the decimal points on it, then management thinks that I derived that mathematically and it's trustworthy. I said, oh, that's fair. It does say it's an estimate. <laughs> it's kind of a good technique. I know. I see some of you like, I'm going to try that. <laughs> but, you know, there is such a thing as a strange fascination with precision. At some point, you have to stop and say, well, now, hold on a minute. You said that you knew to the thousandth of an hour how long that was going to take, and yet our project is six months overdue. I don't think that you really knew, right? <laughs> there's always a reason why people get really precise about things like that and it's not because it's true that's what I'm trying to tell you it's not because it's true don't be tricked by that don't be fooled here's what King said the 70 weeks of Daniel are further divided into three lesser periods 7 weeks 62 weeks and 1 week which is, you know, seven weeks plus 62 weeks is 69, plus one week is 70. Right? That's how he's getting there. Or that I mean, it is, it's true when you look at the verses, he does divide it that way. The first period of time, the seven weeks, which he interprets not as seven times seven days, but seven times seven years, 49 years, for reasons. <laughs> You'll have to read that for yourself. I'm not going to bother to explain it. <laughs> was to be counted the seven years, or I'm sorry, the seven times seven years was to be counted from the giving of the commandment to rebuild the city of Jerusalem until the work was completed. So he thinks he's going to count 49 years from the time that the, the edict is given, rebuild Jerusalem, and that it will be done in 49 years. From the rebuilding of the city to the cutting off of the anointed one, the, the Messiah, was an additional 62 weeks. And that's true. That's what it said in that verse. Or if you take 62 times 7 years, 434 years. And again, this is because he had earlier made an argument that the days of Daniel's prophetic weeks are actually years like I said, for reasons. See the Talmud and the rabbinical ways of interpreting time, blah, 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 I don't care. First mention of a decree to rebuild Jerusalem is Nehemiah 2, verses 1 through 9. There's lots of decrees, he said, uh, made by foreign kings, but the only one that actually talks about rebuilding Jerusalem is this one in Nehemiah. And Nehemiah tells us that that was the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes, which becomes our chronological starting point for this prophecy. And you say, this guy sounds like my crazy uncle. Yes, yes, he does. That's what's happening. That's where this is going? You're telling me you know what year it was when Daniel prophesied, and you can start counting from the edict of Artaxerxes. You think you can fix the reign of Artaxerxes to the year? When scholars typically admit at least plus or minus six, if not plus or minus two to 400, depending on how far back you go. But yeah, he does. 
That's exactly where he's going. And the bigger question is why? What, is, what does it matter? <laughs> True. I don't care when Artaxerxes reigned. I don't care when Daniel prophesied. Couldn't care less what year it was or how many years that was before Rome came to power or before Jesus came to earth or before Jesus left earth or the church was established or whatever else. Because the Bible never talks about those matters in those terms. The fascination is his, not ours, not scriptures. All right. It gets worse as he begins to quote from Sir Robert Anderson. Still in his chapter, Daniel's 70 Weeks, Exhibit A is this guy, Sir Robert Anderson. who wrote a book in 1894 called The Coming Prince. And it is a book precisely about Daniel's 70 weeks, in which he argues that he can account for those 70 weeks with precision. Uh, who is this Sir Robert Anderson? Um, he was the chief of criminal investigation at Scotland Yard during the days of Jack the Ripper. Um, he was made a knight when he retired in 1901. But in 1894, he wrote this book, and this is apparently what he's most famous for, is this book. The publisher said this, Anderson expounds upon the famous 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel 9, conclusively demonstrating the supernatural source of the Bible by its fulfilled prediction of the exact time in history when the Messiah was to appear. So the publisher says the importance of Anderson's book is that it's a conclusive demonstration that the Bible has a supernatural source. What's that mean? It means it proves that God inspired the Bible. How does it do that? It does that by the fulfillment of the prediction of the exact time in history when the Messiah would appear. As in, he takes the 70 weeks of Daniel and turns them into literal time and argues that he knows exactly when Jesus will appear and that the calendar proves that that is exactly what happened. And that this is the conclusive demonstration that God spoke that prophecy and therefore every other prophecy. Yep, that's where he's going. <laughs> Remember, King had said, prophecy, if it's to have credibility, cannot be divorced, divorced from the time frame indicated by that prophecy. Here it is. Conclusive demonstration of the supernatural source of the Bible is the fulfilled prediction of the exact time. That's what King is saying. Why Daniel 70 weeks? Because it has, especially because it has a strong time element. That's why. Look at them next to each other. Anderson said, conclusively demonstrating, I'm sorry, the publisher said, conclusively demonstrating the supernatural source of the Bible. King said, prophecy to have credibility. Prophecy assumes divine inspiration because of English. Anderson said, or I'm sorry, Anderson's publisher said the means by which this was accomplished was the fulfillment of the prediction in the exact time. And King had said the credibility of the prophecy comes from its strict adherence to the time frame. Right, we're, we're not making this up. We're right. He says the Bible can be proven rationally, mathematically, by the calendar, by astronomy. Now let's look at what this knight had to say, because I think you should see this. And the reason for it is because it's not a footnote, and I didn't hear, yeah, somebody, you know, he didn't write. Somebody famous talked about this once. I thought that was interesting, and then said nothing more about it. No, it's the centerpiece 
of Max King's chapter, Daniel's 70 Weeks. The very prophecy which Max King, by his own word, said is the heart of Bible prophecy. This is the central Exhibit A. I'm not misrepresenting him by any means. I want you to understand this was quoted at length, several pages. But I picked the best parts. He said, there could be no loose reckoning in a divine chronology. If God is designed to mark on human calendars the fulfillment of his purposes as foretold in prophecy, the strictest scrutiny shall fail to detect miscalculation or mistake, therein implied. The Lord went up to Jerusalem on the 8th of Nisan, that's a Hebrew month, six days before the Passover. But since the 14th, on which the Paschal Supper was eaten, fell that year on a Thursday, the 8th was the preceding Friday. He must have spent the Sabbath, therefore, at Bethany, and on the evening of the ninth, after the Sabbath had ended, the supper took place in Martha's house. No, I'd, I've never heard that the Last Supper took place in Martha's house. I don't know where that came from. I think Second Opinions 3.16. On the following day, the 10th of Nisan, he entered Jerusalem as recorded in the Gospels. Actually, no, the Gospels did not say he entered Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan. There are no dates provided in the Gospels. The Julian date for the 10th Nisan is Sunday, the 6th of April, A.D. 32. Not only does this gentleman think that he knows when Artaxerxes reigned and when Daniel's prophecy was decreed, he thinks that he has the exact calendar dates of events in the life of Christ. Now, you may be asking, so what? As I was asking the whole time I read this book, <laughs> so what? Here's so what. What then was the length of the period intervening between the issuing of the decree to build Jerusalem, rebuild Jerusalem, and the public advent of Messiah, the prince? What was the length of period between the 14th March B.C. 445 and the 6th April, A.D. 32. How much time? Why the 14th March, B.C. 445? Because he previously argued that we knew when Artaxerxes reigned, we knew what the 20th year was, we knew the month in which Daniel began to prophesy, we knew the month in which Nehemiah said that they started, and the, the rabbis universally agree that, that uh, when no specific day is provided, you start with the first. The interval contained exactly, and to the very day, 173,880 days, or 7 times 69 prophetic years of 360 days, prophetic years, not, ca not solar years, the first 69 weeks of Gabriel's prophecy. All this precision is supposed to be the convincing proof that a prophecy of a precise number of days is verifiably true. That when Daniel said 70 weeks, he wasn't speaking metaphorically. It was literally 70 weeks, and we can prove it. That's where this is going. This is exhibit A on how you interpret Scripture according to Max King. Um, thankfully, Sir Anderson provided us with a chart to do the math for ourselves. The first of Nisan in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the edict to rebuild Jerusalem was 14th March BC 445. The 10th Nisan in Passion Week, Christ's entry into Jerusalem was 6 April AD 32. The intervening period, 476 years and 24 days being reckoned inclusively as required by the language of the prophecy and in accordance with Jewish practice. There's the math. 476 years at 365 per is 173,740 days. You add the 14th March to 6th April 32, that week that he was there, 
20, uh, the two weeks, and they're inclusive according to Jewish rabbinical tradition. That's 24 days. And the leap years, 116 of those, you get 173,880 days. That's how you get there. And I had been taking notes in the book up until this point. This was the last place where I took a note, and my note was, are you serious right now? That's my note. Are you serious right now? And yes, he's serious. This is Exhibit A. That's how this thing got started. That is the supposed rational, calculable proof that that prophecy was true. And thus the Bible believable, if you can believe it. And of course, we need to close with some things that are actually true. Rather than taking on the specifics of, well, yeah, taking on the specifics of whether the prophecy of Daniel corresponds to Nehemiah, you know, whether prophetic calendar years are 360 days, whether the right, the proper reckoning of a month in Jewish time with no specified date is the first. I don't want to get into any of that. Let's go back to the Bible. I was looking for something about words and about things that go on for a really long time and take a lot of patience for you to try and understand what's being said. And I came upon this verse. But this verse had a whole bunch of other verses around it. I realized that they were all pertinent too. So here they are. First one is 2 Timothy 2, verse 14, where he tells Timothy, remind the church there about these things, charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins those who hear it. Yeah, the Bible tells us to beware wordy arguments. The proverb says, in a multitude of words, sin is not lacking. And that's true. You know, if we ask you a simple question and it takes 30 minutes for you to respond, and I'm really confused about it at the end, that's not because you're right. That's because you're wrong. <laughs> in a multitude of words, sin is not lacking. We're not going to quarrel about words. It doesn't accomplish anything. It just ruins anybody who's listening in on that. It makes Christians look unreasonable and bad. You don't need to be doing that. He continues telling him, avoid irreverent babble, verse 16. Avoid irreverent babble. It will lead people into more and more ungodliness. Irreverent might just be profane or secular. Avoid irreverent babble. It leads into more and more ungodliness. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth by saying that the resurrection has already happened. They're upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands... Bearing this seal, the Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. The, the, the irreverent babble leads somewhere. You know, it's one thing to read it, to try and understand it, to, to get a picture of why is this dangerous? Why is this leading people astray? What can we do about this? How can we help that's one thing. It's another thing to allow this stuff to be done, to be taught, to be put forward, to confuse people's minds. All it will do is lead to more ungodliness. All it will do is spread like gangrene. And really, he said, the Lord's firm foundation stands. In verse 19, the Lord knows those who belong to him, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Repentance is key, and God is not fooled. Those are core to the gospel. 
And did you catch there that he said, Hymenaeus and Philetus were among this lot, following the irreverent babble, following the quarrels about words? What had they done? It said they swerved from the truth by saying the resurrection has already happened. Now, I tell you, I wasn't looking for that verse. I was not reverse engineering this. Looking for, did anything, did anybody ever talk about a doctrine where you say the world already ended? I didn't do that. I came here looking for something about wordy arguments. But look what's there. They swerve from the truth saying the resurrection has already happened. Does it apply to AD 70? You bet it applies. Yes, it does. Yeah. I didn't write this. God wrote this. And in the end of 2 Timothy 2, verse 23, he says, Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting opponents with gentleness. Yet we, that's not what's going to happen if you get into it with this kind of a doctrine. So what you have to do is have nothing to do with them. There isn't going to be a gentle end there. There isn't something available where something so blatantly wrong, so far from the truth, is going to have a gentle letdown. That doesn't exist. You have to know better than to get involved with something like that. Oops. That's a different class. I'm sorry. Let me go back for a moment. But, again, the main problem is that it's an appeal to reason and a desire to be thought wise. As much as we pointed out that it's really not very reasonable at all, it's actually manifestly schizophrenic. Um, it seems to be based in math, in astronomy, archaeology, history. And that's what they want it to seem like. And that's what they want it to look like, so that they can have an acceptability among the intelligentsia. So I close with 1 Timothy 6, where Paul says what needs to be said about this. <clears throat> O oh, Timothy, verse 20, guard the deposit entrusted to you, avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have swerved from the faith. It's clear that this doctrine wants to make peace with modern science, wants to make peace with the scoffers and the atheists. And this is what's falsely called knowledge it's nothing more than irreverent babble and contradictions. And professing those things, wanting to be a part of those things, wanting the acceptance and approval of those people and those circles is a good way to swerve from the faith and lose your own salvation. So take the warning to heart on that matter. I hope that that can be clear and useful. Today, if you're not a Christian, it is a day to obey the gospel. It's the day of the Lord. <clears throat> Believing in God's word on the basis of his word and the prophecies that are made there, the things that you can see in the life of Christ and the teaching of Christ as you read it for yourself and it examines your heart and it knows you. You know that is from God. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, give your life to him. Put away the old person and become a new person in Christ Jesus by repenting of your sins, by acknowledging him as the Son of God, by being buried in baptism for forgiveness of sins. We have water prepared that you may obey that gospel. Are you a Christian who hasn't lived right? Repent, make it right with God. Let us help with our prayers on your behalf. Let's come back to God in humility. Come back to the scriptures in simplicity. If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to obey the gospel, let your need be known now by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected. <clears throat>